example of a prestigious speaker from a prestigious, very known uh, company, uh, which is Intel. So, uh, Anand Rajat, which is the director, senior director of the Emerging Security Lab, and also Lili Young is uh, taking part of this uh, second part of the talk, and uh, she's uh, uh, principal engineering in the same uh, lab. It's a great pleasure for us to be here and to accept it both our invitation and uh, thanks also for the ongoing collaboration and what we hope to make it uh, stronger in the future. So thanks all for being here. And thank you. Thank you for the kind intro, uh, uh, Moro, and also uh, inviting us to uh, talk at this uh, prestigious uh, colloquium. And I must say it's an honor to be here. Uh, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, <laughs> one of the oldest is better, uh, uh, universities in uh, Europe. So, uh, so as you see from the, the title, so we wanted to kind of, I guess we wanted to make it slightly interesting, tale of, uh, make it a Dickensian title or something. <laughs> so, tale of two emerging paradigms. We talk about IoT and 5G. You know, IoT maybe not so emerging, it's been emerging for the last four or five years, but it's still, you know, a lot of, um, good research going on in that area, and 5G, of course, is kind of the, the, the communication technology of the future. And so our focus is going to be on security challenges and opportunities in the space. But the way I thought I, you know, I structured the talk was because this is the first time, I guess, we were coming here. So I'll do a very quick overview of uh, Intel Labs, which is the research arm of Intel, which Lindy and I belong to. Do that quickly, and then I cover the, the security challenges in IoT, and then I'll call up uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Lily, who's here in the front row, and uh, she'll come up and talk about uh, security for 5G. Okay, I think I can skip past that. They force us to put it in every... Uh... <laughs> can you confirm that? <laughs> <There> you <go. laughs> so, um, so just this uh, quick overview of Intel Labs. So um, we have a very focused mission at Intel Labs, which is to deliver breakthrough innovations to fuel Intel's growth and technology leadership. And we have some objectives that make up uh, this mission. <coughs> so you want to impact the business with a robust uh, pipeline of uh, innovation. That's number one. Um, we have, as part of the mission, one of the objectives is to collaborate with academia, governments, and industry to advance research, amplify the impact, and I guess deliver tremendous value to Intel. I mean, we always try to have some value to Intel, even though there's a lot of ecosystem uh, focus. And finally, we uh, are chartered with leading uh, Intel's transformation into a market-inspired and experience-driven company. And there are four major uh, uh, research groups within Intel Labs. The first one in the middle row there, uh, architecture and design. So this is CPU, architecture and design. So as you can imagine, this is Intel, so this is kind of you know, bread and butter for uh, Intel Labs. Systems uh, software, so this is where all of the operating system and uh, virtualization kind of research happens. Some of you may have heard about VT, virtualization technology. This uh, lab actually invented uh, VT. Uh, security and privacy is the organization that I belong to, and this is where a lot of the innovation around trustworthy execution environments, uh, new instructions for AES, Galois field multipliers. So pretty much anything you can, random number, true random number generator. So anything you can imagine that has impacted security at a hardware platform level, you know, pretty much came from our lab. And then wireless communication, as the name implies, uh, is all about, you know, communication protocols, etc. And again, I'll give you one guess on what their focus is, uh, 5G, right? <laughs> now, because that's uh, what everyone is uh, thinking. We also have two functional groups, Intel Labs Europe and Intel Labs China. And basically what they do is they represent the collective research portfolio of uh, these two very important groups. Okay. So that's kind of Intel Labs on a page. And uh, you know, as some of you may be aware, um, Intel and specifically Intel Labs has had a long history, I think three decades or so of uh, uh, collaborating with uh, academic institutions as well as government agencies all around the world. And over the last uh, couple of decades, uh, we have also had a fairly intense lab-to-lab uh, -lab collaboration with various industry partners. 
And typically, these are on strategic initiatives that would be of mutual interest to uh, both Intel Labs as well as uh, you know the collaborating lab from that company. Um, you know, one thing uh, I'll note here is, I mean, we have realized a long time back that uh, collaboration or research cannot be done in isolation, right? So I think uh, the thing I like to quote is, I mean, I don't know how many of you know Bill Joy, who was one of the founder of Sun Microsystems. And he, I think, said about 20, nearly more than 20 years back that, uh, uh, you know, no matter how smart you are, I'm quoting Bill Joy, the smartest people always seem to work for someone else. <laughs> so, so he was basically saying, you know, without collaboration, <coughs> collaboration is kind of the fuel for uh, research, if you will. And so we think of, you know, collaborating with academia as one of the key aspects of this. And to that end, Intel Labs has actually set up a worldwide uh, university network. I mean, we call them Science and Technology Centers in the US, ISTC and Collaborative Research Institutes, ICRI, in Europe and Asia. And basically, these uh, ISTCs and ICRIs uh, operate on a hub and spoke model. So there's usually a school that is uh, the hub, leading the whole center, but then spanning multiple spoke schools. And the goal here is to kind of bring together a multidisciplinary committee of the best researchers in a given field, all under the banner of one center. And the other thing that we do, which may be innovative uh, in many cases, we actually uh, locate senior Intel researchers. Like in my lab, from my lab, there are three people who sit on the TU Darmstadt campus in Germany, I think, uh, uh, more or less so, all of them. And they work uh, side by side with researchers. So it's not just a sponsored research in academia and you forget it for a year, but it's like uh, literally day-to-day, week-to-week, uh, collaboration. So that's kind of uh, very innovative. It has worked very well, hopefully for academia, but definitely for Intel Labs. So I thought, I don't know if, um, uh, you know, you're all in academia. Many of you will be thinking about academic jobs, but some of you may be thinking about industrial research. I thought I'd give you a very quick flavor of what the technology pipeline for Intel looks like, right? So I ask you to visualize this as a two-dimensional graph. I mean, you're all students, this should be easy. <laughs> uh, technology maturity increasing on the x-axis and investment level rising on the y-axis. Our academic investments are kind of at the x-y intersection point, right? So we are trying to, you know, develop emerging, you know, cutting-edge perspectives in emerging domains, but with potential for industry. So, so that's what we do at the, at the, at the, at the you know, uh, zero, zero point. Now my organization, Intel Labs uh, job, is to harvest, research, and validate these ideas, right? Working in with, closely with academia in some cases. Then you have um, the Intel business groups that engage with Intel Labs through a process we call internally joint pathfinding to advance the tech readiness of many of these research concepts. And finally, you have the industry ecosystem that would work with the business units of Intel to bring compelling new products to market. And now you can imagine why the investment level goes up, because as you get you know, closer to product maturity and release, and obviously the technology maturity also increases. But all of that, we think, happens because of the Intel Labs academic you know, deep engagement you know, at the bottom right. So, so that's kind of the model. And here's a very quick snapshot of uh, not exhaustive, but a whole bunch of things we do in Intel Labs. You know, this is all the way from enabling the Internet of Things to uh, you know securing your data and devices, ensuring the security, and also <coughs> pushing the frontiers of uh, you know things like big data, context-aware computing, and so on. Again, this is not exhaustive, but it gives you a flavor of everything we do in Intel Labs. And um, you know, now let me just talk very briefly about what uh, we focus on the initiatives within security and privacy research. This is uh, my organization. Uh, we typically like to organize this every three years or so, roughly. And I don't know why we pick four. We always have four pillars. <laughs> the point here is, it's not everything we do, but it allows us to kind of put kind of an external face on you know, 80%, 90% of what we do. And so today, the pillars uh, 
that I'll quickly talk about is, you know, we have a data protection pillar. So this is about saying the fundamental research challenge here is, can we protect secrets in a hostile environment? Right? And um, most of the current approaches today uh, focus on isolation. So you're familiar with ARM trust zone, virtualization technology. So these are all using hypervisors to kind of create a safe and an unsafe uh, environment, right? So it's physical separation. But this doesn't scale. These approaches don't scale very well. So one of the paradigm shifts we have been talking about here is, instead of isolation, can we rely on encryption? So now what you do is you take a sensitive workload, and rather than running it in a separate environment, you actually run it on the main CPU, but protect the secrets in plain sight. So that in one line, for people who are familiar, I know Mauro and some of his group is, software guard extensions, that is the fundamental tenet behind this. Use encryption to run everything on the main CPU, but you still get the same level of protections. Um, another big focus area has been secure multi-party computation, uh, but while preserving uh, the privacy of the data. And there is a number of uh, what I call big data verticals that need this capability, you know, whether it's uh, genomics or finance, you know, we, the one example usage I like to use, uh, uh, I don't, uh, it should apply here too, is, you know, you typically in every country you have a transportation safety administration, uh, the equivalent in Italy, and then there are airlines, right, uh, you know, so at Italia there will be some airlines. Now one of the things you can imagine is, um, the transportation administration uh, will typically have a list of suspect individuals, but they don't want to broadly advertise this all the time because, you know, there's sensitive information maybe. The airlines have passenger manifests, and they don't want to kind of publish this all the time because there's customer privacy concerns. But the two of them do want to collaborate to stop a terrorist from boarding the flight. So that's kind of, you know, one cooked up scenario, which, uh, but then you can take genomics, you know, how to, you know, take petabytes of data and be able to kind of synthesize it for uh, better discovery against cancer and so on. So, so there's all kinds of examples uh, in this area, and uh, that's been an active focus. The current approaches here are, again, not scalable. There are techniques like homomorphic encryption in academia, which is a very interesting area, which is continuing to be pursued, but not scalable. And in practice, there are techniques like data de-identification, where you take some data and you kind of chop it off so it doesn't reveal, you know, any or have any privacy concerns. But as you might imagine, you lose entropy in the data. So we think using techniques that are based on trustworthy execution environments, you know, that I talked about earlier, you can actually, you know, operate on this data and come up with results that are both scalable as well as entropy preserved. 5G security is a pretty big area, as I mentioned, uh, mainly because most of the 5G applications are looking to connect, uh, you know, what I call real-time applications like, uh, you know, power grid or self-driving cars, etc. And then there are privacy concerns. And also many of the innovations that are going into the aggressive 5G performance metrics has profound security implications as well. So, you know, 5G security is very important. And finally, you know, uh, security for the IoT. So if you think about, you know, the active interplay of devices that are on you, you know, wearables, uh, with you, such as, you know, smartphones, as well as around you, you know, embedded sensors in the environment, is creating or spawning some very compelling usages. This is the good news. The bad news is, this is, like someone said, it's like Christmas for attackers, because it's just, you know, expanded the threat surface to a point where, you know, there are many more entry points for a determined uh, adversary. So IoT security and all of the challenges is a big focus area for us. So ultimately the goal is really to deliver scalable end-to-end -end security for uh, usages and platforms. And what Lily and I wanted to do today was basically, this brings us back to the title of the talk, we wanted to focus on two of these areas. Talk about IoT security, I'll do that, and then we'll leave the Should we take questions at the end, or I'm happy to? I'm, I'm quite, so if there's anything you want to talk about here, because there's a, kind of I shift gears into the main topics, but if you have any question either on Intel Labs or anything general that Lily and I can answer, I'm happy to stop uh, for a minute. <coughs> okay, let's
too early in the morning, I think. That's a bad warm up. <laughs> okay. Security uh, for IoT. And here, I think what I wanted to do was quickly cover the motivation. Why do we need IoT security? Uh, talk about some challenges and key research problems. And I think uh, the wonderful people here have made sure that I think I have a demo video with sound, you know, and uh, I think they have made sure that it works, so we'll show that. And then uh, summarize. So, um, you know, let's just start with motivation. So in the last, um, I want to say, two or three years, there's been an increasing trend of security issues in the IoT context. And many of them have made the news headlines. And uh, I thought I'd call out some particularly insidious attacks, you know, on the slide. You know, if you look at the center of the top row there, you know, uh, Shodan is the world's first search engine for internet connected devices. Some people also refer to it as the scariest search engine on the internet because till date it has collected more than a million unique IP addresses of SCADA, control system uh, devices and related uh, software. Uh, Proofpoint, um, a leading security as a service provider, uh, uncovered what may be the first IoT based uh, cyber attack on the internet involving I think was like 750,000 uh, malicious emails from nearly 100,000 smart appliances. This were you know things like home router, media center, even a fridge that were, you know, that had been kind of commandeered and basically used as a platform to launch uh, invasive attacks. So what this tells you is uh, cyber criminals are actually commandeering I IoT components and transforming them into thing bots uh, for malicious activity. Uh, then there was a light bulb attack from Context Research. Um, you know, where a static pre-assigned key was being used to encrypt the, the Wi-Fi password among network light bulbs, and simple reverse engineering was able to kind of extract the password from a 30 meter proximity, right? So some of you may wonder what's so great about hacking a light bulb, you know, but then uh, this becomes much more significant if a light bulb is the weak link in a much higher value security chain. I don't know why a light bulb would be part of your financial system at the bank, but if it is, that would be the entry point, right? So, um, you know, that's why this is significant. Uh, security is as, only as good as the weakest link, as you know. So, uh, at the bottom of the slide, I wanted to call out three attacks that, um, you know, if you talk to IoT companies, they would consider these uh, high-value IoT verticals, right? So that's why I thought I would put it up here. So at USNIC Security in 2014, you know, uh, two, three years back, uh, um, University of Michigan research uh, team uh, showed how alarmingly simple it was to uh, hijack city intersections and cause chaos by making all the lights go green, right? And they were able to do this. All they needed was a, a laptop and the right kind of radio, right? So very, very scary. So that's more of a smart city context. Uh, later that same year, in, um, at Black Hat, a uh, central Florida research team, I think this was Yer Jin, who I think some of you collaborate with, uh, they were able to compromise the hardware infrastructure of a Nest thermostat by uh, leveraging a backdoor associated with the boot process. So suddenly, if you're familiar with Nest, you have a learning thermostat in the home, becomes a spy that can not only snoop on the inhabitants in the home, but also become a backdoor into other security functions you may have, like uh, home security systems. And then, uh, I shouldn't forget this, so at, at Black Hat 2015, as well as next year, uh, the Jeep attack made all of the headlines, right? And many, many companies started focusing on uh, IoT security. And here are a couple of ethical hackers, you know, Chris Balachek and Charlie Miller, used a zero-day exploit uh, to basically um, uh, get into the entertainment system of the Jeep and then send commands to the dashboard, steering, etc. All from a laptop that was clear across the country. They didn't even need to physically be anywhere in or close to the Jeep. So hopefully that convinces you that there's enough motivation for people to be wasting their time on IoT security. Uh, so what is unique about IoT security, right? So, uh, IoT uh, imagines a world where all objects are part of the internet, right? 
every object is uh, uniquely identified and uh, accessible to the network. Services and intelligence are added to this expanded uh, internet. And we have suddenly fused the digital and the physical world together. Um, IoT devices like sensors and actuators represent a very constrained environment in terms of power, performance, and cost. It is extremely hard to deliver security for these design points. Uh, IoT exposes a much larger threat surface than traditional computing like PCs or smartphones that I showed you earlier. Uh, and if you are depending on IoT to mediate day-to-day -day activity, these systems will become mission critical and need to be robust, survivable, dependable, highly available, and so on. And also one thing to note is a denial of service attack, which you might ignore on a PC, you just reboot, has much more significance in IoT because you know, this may be uh, associated with the healthcare scenario, for example. Uh, the fact that the, the adversary has physical access makes tampering that much easier. Uh, device heterogeneity and multiple protocols, you know, increase the security challenge. And then IoT, uh, like smart meters, don't just get replaced like my PC every three years. They last for 20, 30 years, right? So it has a huge impact on things like cryptography, where algorithms and key strings, etc., need to be updated every so often, right? So that's kind of what makes IoT unique. And uh, just so it's the morning, I thought for a little bit of light fun, you know, here's a couple discussing you know, how because of an IoT catastrophic consequence, they have to go out for dinner because the refrigerator isn't speaking to the stove, right? Now, of course, in hindsight, after I put this at three morning, I was thinking, you know, maybe this was a good thing for their marriage. They actually go out on a date or something. But so maybe this is <laughs> not the best example, but at least it illustrates the point. Um, so IoT is a vast space encompassing multiple different uh, vertical applications, right? So. And they may have very diverse uh, architecture, endpoints, functionality. You know, some of them concentrate on controlling and managing infrastructure, like uh, uh, smart grid and transportation on the left. You know, some are very focused on uh, monitoring the surrounding environment. You know, smart buildings, greenhouse, smart factory, etc., in the center. And some others are, um, you know, handle a lot of um, cyber and physical assets for the user. So there's uh, medical, retail, I could have put smart home uh, on the right as well. Um, so given all this diversity, you would imagine that uh, threats and solutions for IoT are very um, diverse. But actually, in our research that we have done in the labs, we see actually a common set of security concerns across all of these verticals, right? <laughs> And let me illustrate, actually, I'll take three usages. I'll try to go through it quickly, just to kind of illustrate this point, why I believe there are common security concerns. So if you think of a transportation usage, IoT transportation, uh, there are a couple of applications we looked at. You know, if you think about smart highway, you know, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, compromising privacy can enable tracking of user location, right? Uh, authenticity is important for uh, proper billing and metering when you're thinking about toll payments. And then uh, safety or lack thereof can compromise uh, life and property. <coughs> Inventory tracking, again, you know, confidentiality is important to kind of protect the trade secrets of uh, vendors. Uh, authenticity of control commands, again, is important for proper routing of trucks and inventory. And then uh, lack of availability can affect uh, timely deliverable of good, uh, delivery of goods, right? So, so you kind of see, you know, we can collect, you know, the security concerns in literally three buckets here. But then let's not stop at transportation. Let's uh, see smart buildings, right? So if you think about building management, you know, the user activity and energy <coughs> consumption, it's very important to keep this uh, confidential. Otherwise, you can actually, it can be a privacy invasion. Uh, Temperature and HVAC, you know, this is the air conditioning, etc. control commands needs to be authentic because if you can forge messages, you can overheat spaces and um, you know, cause tremendous damage to the infrastructure. Elevator control has direct safety issues because if you jam the communications channel, the entire system can come to a standstill. Uh, think about public infrastructure mode monitoring for those who you know, follow privacy news. Ever since, you know, privacy concerns have made big news in the post-Snowden era, where this is this whole thing about uh, trade-off between service delivery, convenience,
convenience of service delivery versus, uh, uh, you know, big brother always watching. Uh, if alarms cannot be authenticated about their source and content, you might dispatch emergency services in random ways, which is not good. And then as more and more digital of the digital city, the smart city is depending on sensing and control, a denial of service attack can just bring, can bring the whole city to a standstill. I think I don't know how much detail I want to go here, but uh, again, if you look at environmental monitoring, you pretty much, uh, you know, again, we took a couple of applications, you can pretty much see, you know, there are consistently, very, very consistently, there is, you know, these three kinds of, uh, you know, security concerns. So, what that says is, you know, we have already understood that the consequences of IoT compromise are catastrophic, right? There is usually life or property at risk, right? So it's not like rebooting your system. And what we conclude is we need a trustworthy, safe, and reliable IoT foundation, right? Without that, I think the usages are very fun and compelling, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, you run the risk of... Uh, you know, all kinds of bad things happening, right? Where, you know, a whole era of uh, computing can come to a standstill if we don't focus on security. So, we decided here, as we looked at the space, that, um, you know, there are three major ingredients, we think, to building such a secure foundation. We need to secure the IoT endpoints, or edge devices. We need to secure the connections between edge devices and other entities. And we need to, you know, secure IoT end to end in some sense, you know, from a life cycle perspective. So, what I'll do next is kind of do a very brief uh, introduction into each and try to identify some research challenges. As an academic community, I figured, you know, this might be more compelling. So, the first challenge here was securing IoT endpoints. And, um, you know, the hypothesis here that all things, meaning all endpoints, need basic security capabilities. And I list some of them here. You know, you need to be able to securely boot up the thing. Uh, you need the thing to be able to attest to another thing. So you need remote attestation. Uh, you need some sort of a lightweight, trustworthy execution environment to protect execution of software on the thing. And finally, you need crypto which is some kind of cryptographic capability in those tiny devices, so things can securely transmit or one thing can communicate to another thing in a secure way. This is a big challenge because of the diversity of uh, these endpoints and edge devices. You know, you can have sensors, actuators, embedded controllers, non-traditional endpoints, etc. cetera. Uh, as you saw in the light bulb hack I mentioned earlier, uh, even the tiniest mode may need to establish trust in order to make sure that the IoT chain is secure. And security or IoT security is not a black and white proposition, right? So you need just enough security for each thing so you can then build uh, applications or IoT applications that, that are end-to-end -end secure. So the key research challenge in this point, in this secure endpoints is very obvious. Uh, as capability, cost, and power budgets shrink from more powerful uh, architectures to embedded uh, microarchitectures for wearables, etc. Uh, huge challenges in delivering security at these design points. Right? You know, how do you do uh, trustworthy execution environments or attestation, etc. You know, when you're really working within you know these highly constrained uh, budgets. So that's kind of the big uh, challenge in this space. Moving on, uh, we need to be able to secure IoT connections. So you'll notice that most IoT usages involve an ensemble of uh, heterogeneous devices. And uh, you know, there may be pairwise relationships between devices. They may also operate as groups. Um, when you think about large-scale IoT, like in a smart city, uh, there's a, another big challenge. A device may need to establish an authenticated connection with a large number, a massive number of devices at the same time. Uh, so self-learning to establish trust relationships as well as secure channels seems to be the key insight in this space. Uh, and finally, usability is a big uh, deal. We need to be able to eliminate manual configuration for the user, right? So we need to make sure that the normal user is able to seamlessly handle their wearables and interact with their smartphone, cars, appliances, etc. And we 
also want to help the system admin deploy and configure a massive number of devices at the same time. And so the key uh, insight here is we want to build secure channels for diverse ensembles. And by diverse, I mean, you know, this could be, you know, the ensemble could be small, large, massive. It could be static, dynamic. It could also be mobile, stationary. It's a lot of diversity, right? So how do you build secure channels for diverse ensembles? And we talk about some key research questions for this phase. Uh, the first one is uh, just device-to-device uh, -device authentication is a big challenge. You know, many of these devices don't have simple input or output capabilities. So there's no way to type in a password or verify a PIN number on a display. So how do you do device-to-device -device authentication? Uh, grouping is another challenge. You know, you need to be able to bring the right set of devices together to perform the intended function. Um, and how do you discover these devices? Uh, ungrouping is important as well. So if a device has accomplished its task, you know, or it's out of scope, the group relationship must end. Uh, you know, what kind of group topologies are appropriate? You know, communication paradigm, you know, is it unicast, multicast, broadcast, or some mixture? Uh, and then when you think about smart cities, I mean, we have to be able to handle, you know, large swarms of devices, and they could be, you know, mobile. Think about cars operating in a city, for example, right? So lots of challenges. And uh, once you have devices authenticated and securely grouped, we have to worry about secure communication of these devices as well, right? So what kind of security services are appropriate for secure communication? And then do we need to come up with customized off-the-shelf protocols for protecting uh, specific IoT applications and workloads? So again, a very healthy set of research questions here. And then I had the last uh, you know, piece of the, the IoT foundation was securing the IoT life cycle. You know, the system needs to start, run, and stay secure. Right? And uh, this means that the initial and subsequent launch must maintain security. Uh, the endpoints or edge devices need to be measurable, attestable to their current status. Um, system execution, this is the run secure part. The system needs to maintain its integrity against malware at runtime. And finally, there needs to be a management system to handle changes, right? Uh, diagnosis, this may need new functions for diagnosis, patching, remote management, etc. And then I already mentioned the security for long-lived devices. So, you know, we have to account for not just patching and updates, but how do you make sure that the crypto survives, the cryptography survives for the lifetime? So what we are really talking about here is cradle to grave secure <coughs> operation. And there are some key research challenges here as well. So if you think about the kind of start secure piece, you know, what are the right set of primitives for these endpoints? We may need a new programming, lightweight programming framework because these are highly constrained uh, devices. So developers need you know, the standard uh, programming frameworks may not work for the developer. Uh, for the run secure part, uh, we need fast, lightweight, and real-time attestation. We may, may need a completely new antivirus solution, you know, to protect against malware. Uh, for the stay secure part, uh, you know, real-time monitoring and diagnosis. It's not just good enough to be doing offline diagnosis because there are real-world consequences. We need fast reaction to attacks uh, and adversaries. And I already talked about secure update as a, you know, kind of a cross-cutting problem across all these verticals. Right? And, uh, and it's also very different. So if you think about update in an automotive context, they typically like for you to go to a repair shop, for example. But then if you look at a television, it stays unpatched for like 10 or 20 years. So very different models, but there's a common, you know, secure update, uh, at least a policy requirement across all these verticals. <coughs> Okay. So hopefully that gave you, you know, so I kind of started with motivating IoT security, but then I also wanted to give you a framework for thinking about IoT security. So those were the kind of the three vectors and the associated research problems. And then I, what I thought I would bring here um, was, uh, luckily I had a video, it was very hard to bring an actual demo <laughs> when you're traveling, um, you know, come do a talk. But this demo, just to do a little bit of setup, um, 
I mentioned earlier that we work collaboratively with academia. So one of the collaborations, engagements we have that uh, Professor Conti is very familiar with is an Intel Collaborative Research Institute in Darmstadt in Germany. And uh, the work we have been doing over the past five years is what is represented in this demo. And from a setup standpoint, uh, we were looking at a vehicle attack scenario, right? So if you think about the modern vehicle, uh, there are thousands of embedded control units, as well as this still starts playing. So maybe I should back up here. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, thousands of embedded control units, as well as uh, networks, car area networks, flex rail, lint, et cetera, all creating a very large uh, attack surface. But arguably the most critical component here is the telematic system. So this is things like, in the US, it's like GM OnStar, I think uh, Mercedes has Embrace, BMW has Assist, etc. So if you're familiar with these telematic system, they have, um, you know, either voice or cellular connectivity, you know, to kind of the back end, right? And so this becomes kind of an extremely uh, vulnerable entry point for the adversary. And once you have compromised the telematic system, that can be a jumping off point to go affect the acceleration system or some other more critical component of the car. And when you think about now the rage is autonomous systems and self-driving cars, etc. Again, uh, like uh, a former colleague of ours used to say, this is Christmas for security researchers, right? <laughs> so you are, there's job security for the next 10 years, <laughs> or research job security for the next 10 years. So, so that's kind of the setup. And what we will show in the demo is uh, our TU Darmstadt team working with my lab actually construct an attack through the telematic system and then show how you can take, a, they were using toy race cars, how you can kind of compromise the acceleration system and cause the car to go flying off the track. And then by using some very lightweight, trustworthy execution environment, you are able to detect the memory violation and then stop that event from happening and institute some fail safe policy, right? So that's kind of the setup. So now let's, yes. Why are cars today consist of a large number of embedded computers called GPUs and actually using automotive buses for such a scan? These perform a wide variety of functions, ranging from engine management to entertainment and for those telematics. Arguably, the attack surface presented by the telematics system is one of the most critical. This subsystem provides connectivity via cellular networks and enables a broad range of features such as accident reporting, diagnostics, and anti-theft. In this exploit scenario, a remote attacker exploits a bug in the telematics and GSM driver in order to inject malicious code which will yield a remote shell on the telematics system. The attacker can then use the CAM subsystem to send arbitrary commands to other ECUs. The candidate might be the ECU responsible for throttle control. It is inevitable that any code beyond a trivial level of complexity will have problems. While it is desirable to reduce to the bare minimum the amount of code we need to trust, the security technology which can enable this do not scale down to ECU class devices. Working in conjunction with TU Darkstock, we have developed a lightweight hardware enforced isolation mechanism we term execution aware memory protection. Using this feature, we can protect critical software and hardware peripherals compromise regardless of whether other software components such as the OS have been exploited. So really I think what this was trying to show you is um, you know using features which today don't exist in you know low-end devices etc embedded control units and so on you can actually be able to go you know so if you have some sort of a security architecture you're constructing within the car network but then all of these uh, the, the tiniest devices, the ECUs, et cetera, are security capable, then you can actually construct a solution where you can detect violations and be able to institute some kind of fail-safe policy, right? So as opposed to flying off the track, the car comes to a control stop, right? So whatever the, your policy might be is now implementable, but you need these capabilities in order to make that happen. Right? So that was kind of the thesis. So to summarize, I hope I've at least uh, convinced you that a trustworthy, safe, and reliable IoT foundation is essential, right? Uh, this comprises securing the endpoints as well as the connections, but also security from cradle to grave, the whole security lifecycle aspect. Uh, and the big challenge, uh, if I look across those uh, ingredients, is scaling IoT securely. There are two forms of scaling. 
One is scaling down to extremely resource-constrained environments. How do you deliver all these features in a tiny mode? As well as scaling across billions of IoT endpoints. So there is all these heterogeneous endpoints, and you need to now be able to construct kind of a secure ensemble out of all of these, right? So the scaling across part is a big challenge as well. And then, you know, again, this is where, as an academic uh, audience, I think this worries companies, but this should be thrilling for academic audience because there is significant research challenges to build such a trustworthy foundation. Okay. So I think that's the end of the IoT security section. So I'll stop here, um, and then as Lily is coming up here, I'm happy to, if there's any burning questions in your mind, feel free. Otherwise, uh, I guess what I should do while that's happening is transfer the... IoT, you mean? So for protection, I think the technology I was talking about is software guard extensions, SGX. Uh, but your question may be different, if you can ask yes, again. So the hardware is it, uh, something uh, uh, at the recent uh, research of uh, Intel, is it about uh, um, keeping uh, CPU, uh, hardware, and processor. Everything is on the processor right. for security, for right. security data. Well, securing hardware, by that what I meant was a lot of what we do in hardware yeah. is creating a foundation, right? Because most of the applications, there is a stack. So you can never ensure complete security in hardware, right? I mean, because there is ultimately there is a system stack all the way up to the application. What, we, what I was talking about there was putting features in hardware that allow an operating system or a web service or an application, whatever may be the case, to build a secure solution. So I guess the answer, if, that's, if I understand your question correctly, is no, I can't deliver complete security in hardware. But I can create the foundational elements. For example, I was talking about in encryption, I was talking about AES new instructions. So if your AES advanced encryption system was using these instructions, you would have side channel prevention, etc., or at least resistance against side channels and so on. So you can get help from hardware, but hardware will not solve the, you know, because in an open system where people are all putting all kinds of things to construct a system, uh, the only way to get security is that entire system has to be secure. Intel hasn't done anything about it. No, Intel has done a lot about it, but in hardware. So what I'm get, what I'm saying is. The entire solution needs all the other vendors, right? So Cisco does routers, Microsoft does operating system. So until someone is taking an application and putting an end-to-end -end secure solution, you won't have complete solution. Intel has done a lot of stuff in hardware security. And I can point you to this, we can get, send a link to the web page, et cetera, which, uh, Because most of the time, uh, when uh, you speak about end-to-end -end, uh, security, mm -hmm. you uh, automatically just go to securing your data, sharing the cloud, etc. Yeah. But uh, if you are building open systems, so of course, the visionaries say, and you will uh, dynamically aggregate services in whatever manner, mm -hmm. even without that. Uh, uh, there are uh, non-functional uh, 
characteristics, features of the system that might be attacked without poisoning the data. A small example. Um, in uh, control loop, you somewhat uh, degrade the performance of the component mm -hmm. so that the loop is not timed correctly. Right. And the generator is late in the system. Right. So, how, uh, how do you consider that? Uh, is, uh, has it been taken into account somewhere? Or, uh, no, so the challenge becomes, so that's where I think the challenge with security is that no one wants to actually pay for security, right? Because, I mean, if you think about it, security is painful. You, you come in the way of usability or something else. So there is some bigger goal, and security is trying to tell you no. <laughs> and so, so the best way to kind of deal with security is, uh, it's I think in one of my slides I said just, just enough, enough security. Yeah. So what you have to do is you have to do kind of a comprehensive analysis of that usage. And you may be able to come up with a very optimal security solution. It's like, you know, I think of security 20 years back when I started in security, I was like everyone else. I thought, you have security or you don't have security, right? Black, white. But what you realize after 20 years of being in an industrial lab is one, size doesn't, one fit size doesn't fit all. And what you actually have to do is a deep analysis, come up with security requirements and threat model at a level that you never did before and then use that and use all of the features to construct the solution. Right. But you also have to hope that your system is never used in a way that you did not expect. Right. And that's another problem because as engineers and researchers, we do this analysis, we do all of the reviews and we put it out. And then a bunch of marketing people are going to talk to customers and they say, oh, you can use it for this? Oh, sure, I'll take more money and do this. <laughs> right, so, so, but again, some discipline has to be, so what we have been doing internally within Intel, I don't know if it catches everything, is we have put some disciplines on not just all the research and fun stuff we do, there's a whole thing called a security development life cycle. So there's a whole community that does assurance analysis of all the, the products, and they inform the general manager of some business unit that these are the risks. Now, if the GM still decides to go ahead for business reasons, he understands the risks, right? So, it's a, so there's, that's handled by process, uh, you know, security process. And just, the uh, problem to combine scaling down in terms of devices, resources, and complexity, and scaling up with yeah. uh, respect to the number. Um, what is, in your opinion, uh, the uh, biggest problem, or at least the most urgent problem for design security in scaling down with respect to resources? Is that the complexity of cryptographic algorithms or the complexity and, and of uh, security protocols Right. Or like the number of, of agents that need to interact with mm -hmm. and so on. So actually at the end of the day it has been for us, and we have done a lot of work actually in my lab in this area, where we have tried to go down to really, you know, again, IoT is a very broad spectrum, right? So when we say IoT, it sounds like, oh, I'm talking about this. No, you're talking about this, right? It's a very diverse spectrum. There are much more capable IoT like embedded controllers and HVAC units, etc. And then there is maybe the IoT that goes on a ring or you know some the tiniest. So when you're thinking about this, what we have done, because we are research, we don't have that much resources, we have tried to pick a couple of points on the spectrum and said, what are the fundamental security capabilities that you might want to deliver? And we came up with four. We said everything, thing means Internet of Things, the thing needs to boot up securely, meaning it has to securely come up to some good state. Then, once it has come up to the good state, multiple of them, a second thing needs to be able to remotely attest to this thing, mutual attestation. Then the third capability is, each of these things needs to run software securely, a trustworthy execution environment. And then the fourth capability is, some cryptography so you can communicate securely between things. So maybe there's one or two more, but we said these are fundamental capabilities and we just proved internally in research that you can implement it on a couple of points of the spectrum. Then you can, so we didn't obviously cover everything, but we have been slowly kind of where possible trying to, you know, so lightweight crypto, lightweight trustworthy execution environments. 
you know, we have something we have standardized called enhanced privacy ID for remote attestation. It's a group signature in scheme. And so things of that sort, just to... Does this thing still run rather, may run rather complex communication problems? Yes, yes. So, so right. Because, because probably also fit security. That's also oh, fit security. And, and I guess the model you have to look at is when you have like a complex heterogeneous uh, ensemble of things, you can say each thing, there are a whole bunch of things that may be security capable. By that I mean it has these four capabilities, for example. And then you may have a set of things that can never ever have security. But there what you say is, you're going to collect all those things and put a gateway that's more capable. And you should never be able to get at those things directly. You have to go through the gateway, right? So, so security architectures have to be constructed very carefully. Otherwise, you know, you just open. topic. <laughs> you know, people really, uh, uh, if they can escape paying for security, they want to escape paying for security, right? That's how, you know, companies have operated traditionally. So I think this awareness thing becomes one very important. But the one thing I think that is working well for us in IoT is the real-time consequences of failures, right? Because I remember the, you know, PC generation, or actually the way I'll tell the story is, I joined Intel about 20, 21 years back, long time, but uh, uh, I clearly remember even within Intel, if I was describing you know, my tenure at Intel, I think there have been three eras of security within Intel. The first era in the late 90s, we were just like a small team starting in a corner, doing some standards work. Uh, you mentioned security, they kicked you out of the room. <laughs> right? I mean, that, so we did a lot of useful work, but it was, we were not popular, right? I mean, no one is like, who cares about security? The beginning days of the internet. The only reason we existed was people were talking about e-commerce. They thought, oh, maybe I need some security, so we'll have these people. But security was not popular. The next decade in the 2000s, this is when TPM and TCG and all this came up. You know, our labs was very involved. Security started becoming important for companies, but if you have a list of five priorities, it was number six. Because you have power and performance and cost and all kinds of other things, right? So, but you are starting to become. But in the last five years, six, uh, 10 years I've noticed, security has become a first order principle now. I mean, even Intel acquired McAfee, for example, right? Many companies have made moves where they think you cannot just have security to stop uh, the blood from flowing or something, a breach. 
but you can monetize security. You can make money of security, right? So, so the thinking has evolved even in you know my my term at Intel. And the other reason connecting it back to IoT is that the fact that you can have a, a loss of property or life in IoT works to our advantage. I know it's scary, but the point is people realize that, right? So one thing that's very funny is um, we, I was just, um, uh, we are now launching this whole initiative around security for autonomous systems. We are starting an ICRI in Europe. And I was so happy because usually you have to promote the need for these things. And then two weeks back, uh, my wife takes me to this, says, oh, there's a new movie, let's go watch this. It's called, I don't know how many have you heard, you may not care, but it's called Fate of the Furious, right? I, I'm not recommending the movie. <laughs> but but this, this movie, there's a five minute YouTube video, if you can catch it on YouTube or something, you should catch it. For five minutes, they take the New York City metro area, and there is a bad person, actually some lady called Viper or something, and she is trying to assassinate some Russian diplomat who is traveling in an entourage, and they compromise all of the autonomous systems in New York City, route that whole procession in a certain direction, stop it in front of a, some BMW showroom or something, and again using autonomous drive thing, make the cars fall on top of the, <laughs> and, and basically, achieve their job, right? So they basically, in five minutes, compromised 90% of the autonomous self-driving cars in New York City, right, using, enabling the auto drive function. And it was beautiful. It's like Hollywood advertising your, <laughs> you know, the need for your research. So what I'm getting at is awareness is increasing, especially in the IoT and autonomous. And the second one, liability, my short thing is that's where I do my expertise does stop because what happens is when I get into my lab is getting into areas like uh, multi-party analytics for genomics, etc. Not just in uh, self-driving cars. There is a liability question about you know what happens if something goes wrong, right? So from a research lab, what we have been doing is we have been trying to raise awareness with our legal side, and then sometimes we can provide technological tools saying, hey, you know what, we can do formal analysis of this part that will raise the assurance of this subsystem. So we can give you some tools, but please work with your legal community and start putting some structure around this. So, but unfortunately, beyond that, I don't think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Goes beyond our, our expertise. Our zone, exactly. exactly. But I mean, since uh, I mean, hardware can be the root for exactly. security, maybe yeah. can be also the root for verifying or assessing. Exactly. That's what I meant by formal verification. So what we are telling our legal people is we can give you higher assurance that this works by doing certain things which raise the cost of the product, but it decreases the liability, you know, the risk profile. So there are some technological aspects we are telling them we can provide, but you have to start having this conversation because it's not just about building a self-driving car and just putting it on the road. You have to go solve this whole problem before you start doing self-driving cars. In fact, Germany, I think, uh, just announced the ability to do autonomous systems in Germany, their only mandate is there has to be a human in the car where who can take control if the autonomous system is actually, uh, you know, not functioning. Okay. 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 Thank you. of this. Uh, I spent several years, quite a few years, in the what is research first before I come in joining the security uh, community. So we'll talk about 5G. So um, just, you know, a quick slide on the mobile network evolution. I think, you know, we all live in today, you know, with the LTE, uh, 4G, and Historically, has been uh, we have observed that almost every decade will have a you know a evolution step in this uh, what was it the mobile network right we started with the analog network in the 80s and then by the time we get to you know 3G was uh, um, uh, about in the you know, beginning of the century uh, we have you know much more widespread use you know, in, in the world, across the globe. 
and LTE really give us the, the high bandwidth mobile network internet, right, on everybody's phones. So, so what is 5G? You know, why do we need 5G? Uh, is that really about even higher data rate? I mean, the, if you look at the revolution from, you know, analog to 4G, it has been really mostly about increasing the data speed, right? So is that it? So actually, um, I think 5G, at least in my mind, and, and I think a lot of people agree, is not really just about the super higher speed anymore. Uh, for the first time, I think there is uh, a lot more focus on you know, the new set of applications that the, the cellular connectivity is going to uh, enable. And Anand talked about IoT, and that's all about things, right? So 5G also is really about connecting not just people, but things. Because you know, if you think about today, everybody has a phone already. So pretty much we saturated the connectivity for people right, uh, on the globe. And so things are the, really the next frontier. And, uh, and it, this is where all the new requirements come about for 5G. And so here I'm showing this triangle to demonstrate sort of the three set categories of the um, uh, devices and applications that 5G is supposed to enable. And at the top is the enhanced mobile broadband. This is what we are more familiar with, you know, with the phones, you use that to uh, access the mobile internet, right? So that, you know, is really more focused on the highest speed, you know, we're talking about now, now multiple gigabit seconds, um, you know, to enable some of the new applications like, uh, you know, virtual reality, um, uh, 3D video, you know, really high resolutions kind of video and, and uh, VR applications. But more interesting is at the bottom, those two uh, endpoints that in, in this triangle is on one side you have this massive machine type communication that is more uh, categorized by the, the number of devices, but each device is small. They don't send a lot of data, right? They may be sending the, you know, the thermostat sending some uh, data about the, the temperatures uh, or the smart meter sending about the, uh, the power consumptions, but they don't send, each of them does not send a lot of data but it's the number of them uh, that is the, the challenge. So um, that's on one side of the uh, uh, applications for all the things. On the other side, we have new set of applications that really focus on um, ultra reliability and low latency. So this is the real time aspect that Anand talked about. Like uh, autonomous car need to make a real time decision constantly and uh, a smart factory needs to have a very reliable network to enable you know, very low latency because the, uh, you know, the control loop, uh, the uh, proper function of the control loop in the factory depends on that. So that is a new set of uh, requirements that uh, the traditional mobile network have not really dealt with. You know, the most uh, stringent and demanding application so far is really video streaming. And um, that's really, um, you know, we're talking about still um, more of a human perception kind of a latency. Here, it's a, it's a magnitude or two, you know, lower. So, with that in mind, then, um, you know, there's a lot of study already uh, kind of capturing the requirements from all those different applications on the left. So you have this graph showing this, you know, multiple dimensions of different uh, performance metrics, right? You know, about the data rate, the range, the uh, net, you know, error capacity and energy consumptions, and then the density, you know, uh, capture how many devices within a small area that you need to support. And then the latency, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, 10 to 10 milliseconds, <coughs> for example, uh, instead of today, it's more like the hundreds of milliseconds latency. And then, you know, mobility. Um, so, so that's the sort of the, the dimension of the metrics that we were going to measure the, the performance of 5G. On the right, 
I like this uh, graph from uh, NYU better because it sort of highlights <coughs> the three different categories of vocations that I talked about early. They kind of pull you into different directions. So they're not all point you, you know, from a designer's point of view, um, into the same kind of design. So, uh, you know, at the bottom you have enhanced mobile broadband. That really focuses on extreme data rates, okay? So those require certain kind of innovations at the physical layer of the radio to enable that. And then the extreme capacity from the network's point of view, right? But if you look at the massive internet of things on the sort of left upper corner, that really focus on ultra low energy consumption, right? Because those devices, that, that is really the, the constraint that they have. And very low complexity and uh, ultra high density because then you're going to have a lot of them. Um, and think of like the, uh, a swarm of drones, for example, uh, to, co uh, to accomplish a certain task. And then on the right, uh, upper right to left, is that the mission critical control application that we talked about. That really focuses on what they didn't see, uh, ultra high reliability. And here, you know, for the first time, strong security for this set of applications becomes really, really important. Why? Because it ties back to other um, attributes that really people care about. Safety, right? And uh, uh, functional re uh, reliability. And those things, you know, people, in, in certain applications, people are willing to pay for. So this really highlights sort of the challenge for the whole mobile community uh, today. The whole industry is facing this, you know, uh, very different kind of requirements coming from different applications. And how do you satisfy that with the, with the one single network? That is the challenge. So what I'm going to uh, use uh, for the rest of the talk is really use one application because, as I said, you know, it would point you to different, you know, aspects. There's, uh, you know, a, a army of researchers really in the industry and academic focusing on 5G right now. Um, so I'm going to use one applications, uh, V2 communications, V2X is vehicle to everything, to really demonstrate sort of the the challenges that we face, especially around security, uh, uh, in the context of 5G. So let me define uh, veto x first, right? This is, stands for vehicle to everything. There are other names, you know, that the research community have used before, you know, uh, vehicular area networks, cars to cars, um, connected cars, cooperative intelligent transportation system, always focus on the connected aspect of it, right? So the vision here is really for the vehicles to leverage this uh, external entities, information coming from the external entities to complement onboard sensors to enhance driving experience. So in parallel to this connected car vision, there is always, you know, all the, the discussion uh, and excitement about autonomous driving. The focus on autonomous driving has always been using onboard sensors and the intelligent machine learning system to really uh, collect this information and understand the environment around you and then make decisions for the driving, right, uh, in real-time fashion. And this is a complementary vision. It's about using information coming from outside of your cars, from other cars or from the infrastructure to complement that, uh, the same uh, angle, okay? And so the application and the, the specific motivation for that could be uh, safety, Right to because um, you know the sensors that you have on the car has a limited range. So this information coming from other car, they can give you information that your onboard sensor cannot see uh, in, in the short time. So you know you will not be able to see around the corner, but the other car can tell you. You know I'm traveling on this road and uh, at this speed, and if the sensor don't detect that, at least that information is a complementary piece of information that can provide you know, stronger safety. For energy saving, for example, a, a group of cars traveling much closer than what you would, you and I would feel comfortable uh, with the human sort of perception delay. 
but with powder cloud communication, you can allow that distance much shorter, and this will save you energy. This is especially com uh, compelling for like trucking company uh, with a fleet of trucks, you know, and for convenience, tall collections, or for route planning and knowing the road conditions ahead of time, um, but in you know more or less real time will help you you know uh, plan your route better. And then traffic optimization, right? You know, people talk about the vision. When you come to an intersection, you can, I mean, today, you can, with the traffic lights, you can manage so that you, you, you know, you drive the car at the right speed so that you don't need to stop. But eventually, you can do away with the traffic lights. And the cars just communicate with each other, and then they weave, you know, as they cross each other. So, so what are the security and privacy challenges here? So let's talk about the privacy first, right? So the, 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 the fundamental challenge in, in this kind of vision for, um, for consumer is that it seems like a perfect way for the, bro the big brother to track everything, right? Now you can track the cars, track the users and the uh, passengers and drivers. So, so that is the number one concern that we need to address as we design such applications, uh, is to make sure that you preserve the anonymity for the, both the people in the car and the cars itself. And so that you would not um, be able, on a long-term basis, to track one car to not, uh, you know, as it travels through the space and time. Uh, at least I, in, the, in the U.S., U.S. Department of Transportation is evaluating the technology called DSRC, which is not based on cellular, uh, it's based on Wi-Fi, but for the same set of applications. That is sort of the first instantiation of this uh, vision, right? And, but I think some of those, um, the challenges that they face, I think the 5G community is going to face uh, the same way. Uh, so Department of Transportation in the U.S. make it very clear that at least for the system that they are designing, it, it prevents the, the personal and uh, sensitive information uh, uh, to be stored uh, for long term. And uh, other than the very short time they used for the safety uh, crash avoidance applications. But then on the other hand, you have some conflicting requirements here, right? Uh, where the unique ID and tracking is legitimately required. Uh, for example, if you know you're involved in an accident, you wanted to be able to demonstrate what happened, and so you not you wanted to have some kind of uh, uh, for legal forensics or insurance purpose that produce some evidence that's non with the non repudiation property, so that you know there's no ambiguity in what actually happened. And then there's the uh, the cellular network always has to satisfy lawful intercept requirements, which is, you know, under a proper court order that some of the communication would be intercepted and tracked uh, by the, the law enforcement. Um, so you need to satisfy that when it's, prop, uh, it's appropriate. And that OEM, even the vendors, right, you know, the, um, uh, for the cars, they wanted to be able to do recall. So they need, when, when something goes wrong, a component is, you know, default and they need to upgrade it and fix it, you need to uh, be able to recall those systems. So you need to know what are the car's you know, component function and how they, uh, um, uh, wh wh when it's appropriate to recall them. And then there's also, because of all this concern about security, they, you know, uh, we need to protect against misbehaving or malicious cars uh, uh, that's on the road you know, doing something bad. And so you need to be able to actually identify them and report them, right? Um, so that is sort of the, 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 the dilemma and the um, research challenge is how do you come up with a mechanism that satisfies the first requirement, but when it needs to and when it's appropriate, you also will be able to enable the other application that we talked about that needs to identify, right, uh, the user and the, and, the, and the car. And then in terms of security challenges, right, when you think about communication between the cars and the car with the infrastructure, 
you need to do the, um, you need to first secure the communications. So between the cars and between the cars and the infrastructure, you know, the, the, the messages that carry over this uh, communication and all the other elements supporting that message exchange need to be authenticated, you know, uh, um, the sometimes encrypted, but a lot of time depends on the patient. The more important is integrity protected, right? So you don't want the message to be altered in any way because you're going to make decision based on that information, right? So um, the other uh, part of this is that it's not just about from one radio to another, you need to protect the channel between them, but it's really about, you know, the data integrity end to end. So the question, fundamental question is, if my car is going to make decisions that affect my safety based on information coming from other cars, strangers, right, that I encounter on the road randomly, can I trust those cars? Can I trust the data I receive from those cars? So now it goes beyond the communication channel. It's really about the ultimate data that carry from those uh, sources. So if one of the cars is compromised because of the telemetric hack, and some data is injected over other car, it can still be properly signed and authenticated and everything, but the data itself is being compromised at the source of the other car, right? So this is a much harder problem. It goes beyond just communication. You need other mechanism to, to ensure that, right? Or if, you know, complete prevention is not possible, then at least you should be able to detect that when the data is compromised. And then also this, you know, uh, the whole, uh, you know, so hundred millions of cars here in the road, on the road. So there's a lot of organization, structure, and process are involved in designing, enabling this kind of uh, infrastructure. So those entities need to be also satisfying the security requirements so that, you know, they are not the weak link uh, and entry point for uh, uh, malicious attacks. So scalability, like I said, other requirements are scalability to hundreds of millions of cars, and then low latency to meet the real-time requirements. So this just shows you in a connected car system, you know, how you take those informations and um, to, to make the decision, right? So let's start from the bottom. So those kinds of information if coming from other cars on the right, you know, you, you gathering those information from the cars, those information can come like very raw uh, sensor input even. So beyond just uh, uh, simple information, you know, you can imagine if my car has a lot of sensors, other cars have a lot of sensors, you can actually have, we call it cooperative perception, meaning that you can see through other cars' eyes. So a lot of the uh, raw input from other sensors through other cars can be, you know, coming in. That require very high, uh, higher data uh, data rate, right? Or it can come from the top, which is more process result in other cars. You know, after the filtering and pre-processing, the other cars send more simple information. You know, lower data rates of information. So either way, you're getting those information, and then you're gonna inside the car do you know your predictions and trajectory planning based on that information. And, and on the left side, you have this uh, box, we have interpretation and probability check. This is where I think the most important piece to think about when, how do I um, protect against those kind of data or malicious data injection through other cars. Because the communication channel might be protected, but if the other car is compromised, this is where I think you can use the all this data um, as a, there's a lot of, physical, logical redundancy in the data as the cars travel on the road. You know, you still, even if it's malicious car, inject and compromise certain part of the sensors. As long as not all the sensors and not all the cars are compromised, right? Um, then at least you can use some of those machine learning, maybe, here to do the, the probability check and see, does this data even make sense, right? Or is it conflicting contradicting with other data that I get either from my own sensor or from other cars. And that's where you can filter out and detect some of those attacks, potentially. 
So, um, so we talked about the V2X in the concept of, you know, uh, in the context of really between the cars. But there was a whole backend network from the operators, right? Uh, your, you know, your Vodafone or at and that they need to enable at, in, the, in the data center, in their basically the operator's data center, to, um, to enable and ensure the security. So there's a lot of requirements there. I'm gonna just really brief mention like, the, the idea that you have one physical network and then you're gonna support the cars, your, uh, your phones, all the you know, IoT devices, and they all have different requirements. So how do you slice the network logically and virtually so that you can enable and isolate those different set of applications? That's called network slicing. So that's a one huge uh, uh, new concept that uh, is being worked on. And then this whole you know, software-defined networking and network function virtualization really is a way to allow all these different services being deployed dynamically in the network. Again, this is from the operator's point of view, and that's very important too. And then um, there are some specific you know, requirements for low latency support. So in order to do that, traditionally, your phone cannot talk to my phone directly right, today. You have to go to your tower and then you know, eventually get back to my phone. That's how the connection is. It's always through the infrastructure. That's really taking too long okay, for some real-time application. So you need direct radio-to-radio, -radio, direct device-to-device -device communication between the cars. Really, we're talking about low code, right, without going to the infrastructure. So that's a new kind of uh, 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 access, radio access mechanism need to be enabled there. And then, uh, in order to allow this kind of uh, really short latency, sometimes you need to have local intelligent roadside units right there serving the, the cars around you and uh, with a lot of intelligence, again, so that you don't need to go all the way back to that network uh, um, in the back end. So those need to happen as an infrastructure. And then we're also deploying uh, at the radio access you know, network multiple Towers and uh, multiple base stations are going to serve each individual device so that you have diversity. Uh, if one is being jammed or unavailable, you have another one you can fall over. And that will also help with the security and, and availability. Okay, so um, in summary, uh, just you know, using the vehicle application, that's really a one single application. But as an example use case, you see that. Um, you know, that's really what 5G is about, is, is really about those things, right? And, um, you know, talk, we talk about each application has different challenges, and so there's a lot of innovation to enable that. And um, so, yeah, so this is actually a very exciting area for what is, you know, communication researcher and the security researcher. Thank you.
Tom, again, you know, with the modem, with the SIM, has some kind of authentication, just like the, the phones that you have. So there is some trust relationship already established between the cars so the and the network. Through the network. It's through the network. And then, so then the next question is based on that, you can bootstrap the trust relationship between the cars, right? But at least you have something to start, yeah, yeah. somewhere yeah. to start. Yes. Okay. Now the, yeah, the other thing used to in Sensor Networks, they used to talk about, but didn't get much attention because I guess things were static. Mm -hmm. There was this notion of spontaneous group formation and dissolution, meaning yeah. you bring together a group for a particular task and you disband the group. Mm -hmm. right. That has more synergy with this whole mobile transportation right. kind of scenario. Right. Yeah. So some of that, even though that research, no one did much research because of the static nature, but that was talked about 10 years back as well. But that may have more resemblance with the challenge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, as you move through, yeah, you'll have very dynamic group. So th there are research people looking at that.